Okay, hi there everybody. This is Mark Bromley, author and artist of the Urantium book series. And today I'm working with AI assisted chat GPT and uh, Dolly 3 and Copilot with a very simple rendition of Colusius from the chapter 11 to govern the people. He gets introduced in that part of the chapter and he is a known governor on the island of Urantium. Uh, his skin is actually blue with yellow highlights in the shadow area when he's actually shaded. Wherever you see a shade, a dark shade, it's actually supposed to be yellow. The AI can't really capture it correctly. It doesn't understand the duality of my color scheme. And it doesn't really understand these scales either. Uh, it's struggling. It's just grabbing a hold of swatches and individual images that it has in its collection. Here we see uh, what it did for Colusius here. And Colusius looks like a lot like uh, Michael McConaughey. He found a role in my Euranthium book series as Colusius. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? He does look like Matthew McConaughey, doesn't he? Probably from uh, Reign of Fire. You know, the guy in the tank that was leading the group of people with the tanks and the helicopters. Michael McConaughey. Yeah, there he is. And... Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I think that's the stock image that they're actually using right there. Now, you know, when I was describing Michael McConaughey here, he doesn't have a mustache in the picture. He just has a beard, and it's a long, tapered beard. Uh, it doesn't have sideburns. It's not thick or anything like that. So it's struggling again on with that, and if you shave the beard off, I'm pretty sure the jawline is way off because of it. Uh, the ears are a little wrong, but kind of okay-ish because it's supposed to have the two back ridges and it, but it has the two bumps so it's workable I can actually work with those ears at this point and so I can say that they they're getting more under control I can say that and the neck's still a little bit too long for a guy I think uh, so but that's all right we're it's still a work in progress this isn't something I'm actually going to use for anything uh, but it is giving me ideas for uh, what I can do to improve my own images uh, for when I get around to it. And here we go, we got a, another picture. Uh, it looks still kind of like Michael McConaughey, but uh, McConaughey, yeah, that's a guy's name, I don't know. Well, anyways, uh, yeah, it's uh, but it's a little bit long in the face now, and you can see the elongation taking place throughout the AI imagery. Uh, so there are some things. The ear actually has the two pointed ridges on the back a little bit better. Uh, so yeah, that's workable. That's even usable. Uh, the scaling is wrong. The scales are much too big around the eyes. Uh, I guess the blue and the yellow shading is still a complicated issue. I guess the interlaced skin is just uh, difficult for the computer to actually generate. But this is actually all right. Uh, uh, we do have a drawing of uh, what it's supposed to look like, but it keeps adding the mustache. Not once was the mustache mentioned. There was no mention of a mustache, just a long tapered beard, which is more straight, more on the chin, more like a goatee kind of thing. Maybe a little bit of hair on the side, maybe. But uh, but it's just a really long uh, kind of tapered beard uh, in the front. And uh, we're really not getting that. Got some ridges on the nose frame right there. But this is probably the most, uh, uh, a, a lot better in, in the imagery there. He does have the little necklace that he's wearing. Actually, I guess he has two necklaces in the book series. Um, one his uh, daughter gave him, and then this other one that the king gave him. And uh, his ears ended up with a whole bunch of frills on the back. Oh, well. Can't get perfection out of this. But uh, we are getting his uh, image down right. His green eyes and stuff like that are working out a little bit better. I lost the green eyes. And uh, now we're back to this again. And uh, I like the wrinkles on the forehead. This is actually getting kind of more prominent, uh, more regal. So, uh, yeah, it's it's actually good. We still get that mustache, and the beard is still getting too overflowing. And uh, it's still struggling. The ears are too straight now. Uh, so it, it's still struggling. These are some of the earlier images. This is some of the later images. And now he's showing more age because uh, he's an older elf. And uh, 
I don't know, it's a black beard, so I don't know where they got the gray on the beard, but he ain't got gray on his beard now, so uh, there he is, making it a little bit older. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's supposed to be yellow in the shaded area. Uh, I guess trying to make that kind of difference is difficult for the AI, but it is uh, still a useful tool. And uh, Governor Colusius, he is uh, one of the smarter governors on the island, one of the less corrupted governors. He's actually a family man with a wife and a child. And in the book, there's a little bit of tragedy for his story. And we start to explore what Satoria is uh, as she runs into Governor Colusius. And uh, we meet him for the first time as he must save uh, his town of Farmer Town from the oncoming slaughter of the machinations that took out the Mages College that was on the fringe of Farmer Town. And he witnessed it all. And, uh, well, that was part of the thing that was in the book there. And you will actually see that chapter. It seems like an odd chapter, kind of out on the fringe. And you're wondering why it's out on the fringe, uh, why it's kind of like an individualistic kind of chapter sitting on its own. And uh, there is a real good reason for it. And it actually introduces another aspect to the story that some of the story is not actually connected to other parts of the story. That some of it is actually happening in different parts and different places throughout the region. In the first book, I tried to make the differences not so far apart, trying to keep them kind of close together. Because when you start with the timeline, it is somewhat linear at first. And then we start introducing elements of reflection, of memory, what came before, what's happening now, what's happening then, and what will happen, or what is in the process of happening, starts to become intertwined in a temporal causality. Uh, one th uh, type of time taking place over another type of time that results in these incursions, which might seem like alternate realities or paradoxes in a way because they, they conflict with the story in a way that you have the first incursion, then you have the second incursion, and uh, some of those mini incursions along the way uh, because of some of the conflict that has taken place for the overall story arc that is evolving within the storyline, which is quite complex when you start seeing some of the aspects that I'm explaining about my own life, my reflection on the terrible totality of a North Korea like USA that has been happening for over 50 years and it's reflected in my life. It was reflected in the events of George Floyd. It was reflected in the events of uh, many activities that created alternate stories of people who used it for their political gain and for their political uh, manipulation and control of the population. But the stories were always falsified, always twisted and distorted, especially by those who I ran against who tend to be actually quite imaginative and creative people themselves to some extent. But, you know, I'm actually the greater creative, the greater mind. And uh, they are upset about that because they know that much of what they try to do is actually based on me. And they know that. They know it for real. And uh, But yet they try to silence me because uh, they don't want the truth getting out that they are not that smart. They're not smart at all. They just had a system that gave them access to the resources that I should have had. And it's just that simple. I mean, here I was, an artist growing up in North Korea, North Glen, Colorado, in poverty. And uh, here I was in high school, like a lot of high school kids, not seeing my future, not knowing what my future could be. And uh, I, I'm a person that likes to do art. I'm, a, I'm an artist, and I always like to do that. And I'm being told that I should become this engineer and this 
smart person building like rocket ships and boats and trains and planes and I've done all those things and uh, and I'm actually more happier when I'm just doing art reality and then eventually a couple of teachers came along and said I should go to college but I'm poor I don't I don't see that future for me I don't see how that's going to work but somehow I managed to get picked up as an artist by uh, well Colorado Institute of Art at first wanted me, but I couldn't sit there in Colorado Institute of Art and try to do this conformist art that you see through the AI, through the lens of the AI conformity in art. I couldn't do that. And, uh, you know, it's where the artist in the middle of the room is doing exactly what the artist is doing in front of them, doing exactly what the artist is doing behind them, doing exactly what the artist is doing uh, to the left, to the right, to the catty corner, on either corner, all the way around. All the artists in the room are doing the same art. It's just a sphere, and they're all shading the sphere the same. The sphere is the same size, the same color, the same design, and they're doing the same image because they were all being taught and trained to be expendable, replaceable. That's what they were being taught. And so I picked up uh, another school called... Western University of Colorado. Well, at the time it was Western College, of Colorado, but it was trying to become part of CU, and uh, apparently, I guess it's become its own entity. Entity now, it's Western University of Colorado, over in Gunnison, and uh, the art teachers there, they realized that my technique was rather good, was already complete, but they uh, didn't want me to be an artist that created the same image as everybody else. As a matter of fact, they tested me a couple of times and they realized that even without glasses that I needed, that I could actually paint the image with more feeling than the other students around me. Uniquely. And this is something that they really wanted to foster in their students. Uniqueness in art style. And, uh, it, it, you know, it showed quite frequently. Many of them would do uh, run-of-the-mill art that the college told them to teach, but they didn't like being told what to do as art. They never did. So what they exonerated was the uh, artists that actually thought differently, that could manipulate different forms exceptionally. And the reality of college was simply to acquire knowledge about different concepts and ideas to incorporate in your artwork kind of a, like a collage of techniques and ideas and then to be able to use those techniques providing that you have an art studio and a workspace and the actual equipment to work with um, when I got to Japan I ran into a bunch of uh, Japanese people that wanted to make fun of me for going to an art college I found people here in North Korea, Northland, Colorado, doing the same thing, trying to make fun of me for going to an art college. And every single time I talk to them about their art college, it's like, no, the only thing they really taught me is how to use different techniques. Kind of like, if I have the ability to bookbind, I can bind a book. I can make a book out of leather, out of cloth, out of anything. I can make paper. I can do washi paper. I could make rice paper. Literally, I could make rice paper if I have the tubs I need and the water I need. I can make that. I can create that kind of stuff from scratch. I can make my own ink from charcoal, mash that up, and use it, put it into a vehicle so I can actually turn it into an actual real ink that with a dryer in it, with a drying agent so it dries on its own. I can make that too. But all those things, all those things that I could do with, a, with my art requires an art studio. It literally requires a workspace, not just a desk or a table, an actual workspace, which is the most baffling thing to the morons in art that I keep running into that wanted to try to tease me about going to art college and that they don't think you need to go to art college for art. Well, yeah, you do. You have to go to an art college for art, because otherwise, how are you going to understand the value of an art studio? 
the very first thing I was trying to do on a Kickstarter was to create an art studio. I had a design for the architecture of the art studio and what it would look like. And, and still, no funding, no, no resources, nothing. Because I am dealing with an ignorant society, a modern society of complete ignorance aimed at the artist, trying to subject me to a brutal conditions and hatefulness, never realizing that I am never going to live up to my potential because I'm never going to have the resource or the access to the resource that I want. It's like the sales on my Euranthium book. They are so slow and sluggish that I keep getting a whole bunch of really awful and terrible people that are actually literally trying to steal everything. It's like my website is uranthiumbromley.com because I was talking to people about my Euranthium book series. And when I was talking to them, some real asshole went out of their way to grab uranthium.com deliberately to steal the website name so I wouldn't use it. So I would have to pay them. That's what they put in their cyberbullying email to me, that they stole the website so I would have to pay them. Quite literally. And then I had to tell them, uranthium is not a common word. Uranthium is a made-up word. I created it. I created uranthium. The characters' names, like Lucius, Camithra, Rorelmir, Ronanes, Hespesia, Thernia, Gethia, all these are created by me. So they're all copyrighted names, because I just created them. I create these names specifically to be unique. Even when I got to the word Impandalu, I created that as well. Because I didn't want any debates or fights and squabbles over the property assets of what I created. And there are these people out there now trying to steal these ideas and these concepts because they think they can use exploitation, extortion, and other kind of insane and inane ways to steal what I've created. And all it's done is create delays and slow down the process of creating books. Because they, they are selfishly thinking of themselves, non-creative, non-artistic, non-inventive, just thieves of art. And you've seen the theft of art. Here in North Korea, North Korea, Colorado, the government itself stole my artwork. I heart in. I talked about that in an earlier video. They stole that because they were upset that I came up with better art than they had. And they did it on bags because they created a law here in the state of Colorado limiting uh, the bags that you can get at grocery stores by charging 10 cents per each plastic bag because they became insane and jealous and they thought they were saving the world because of the Ferngully syndrome that's infecting a lot of their brains. And not only did they do that, but in 2021, I created another idea that I created a draft for, and it was called Homelessness. It was a painting that I was trying to sell to uh, get elected in office and try to uh, change the homelessness condition that the Nazi Democrats created within the United States. Yeah, they did. They created the homelessness situation because they wanted to target local people and displace them and replace those houses, those families, and all those homes with foreign invaders by opening the border, by using the IRC and flooding the United States with refugees, with a refugee crisis. And this was just local displacement. And this is why they were attacking me, because I meet that that category of their Ghazi, their Nazi Ghazis. Ghazis are globalist socialists. Nazis are national socialists. National socialism failed. So they progressively got worse with their ideas of socialism, communism, Nazi, fascism, national socialism. Now they're globalist socialists with the WEF, BlackRock, Schwab, Soros, Nazi Emerge, 
these people came out in the open and decided to target me because I was poor, living in poverty, and that is who they always attack. It's like in video games. Have you ever played video games? The strong attack the weak. Broken philosophy. Broken philosophy is what they teach in our modern world. The strong attacks the weak in every single video game that you play. When in fact, the purpose of the strong is to protect the weak, to help elevate the weak so the weak can become the strong. Because eventually the strong will become old and they will become weak. So they will need the strong to protect them as well. You don't stay strong forever. Strength is an illusion. And this is why you have to think of it as a family of wolves. Where the wolf pack, the strongest always puts the weak in the front because they have to protect all of the things that are valuable within their pack. And, and it's a pretty simple concept right there that uh, is failing in our modern world because of the progressive progress, progress driven Hitler speech Gazis, the globalist socialists that are taking over the world through the UN, the WHO, and that nonsense of the common cold that they called COVID. Yes, I did have it. Yes, it was pretty hard on the lungs, but it was just a super bug that was uh, minor, mute, and kind of weak. I got over it pretty quick. And it was introduced to me by a person that actually got vaccinated. So did the vaccinate, was the vaccine actually the vehicle of a weaponization of it? Yes, it was. It was the proliferation of it. And they did it through a vaccine. And if they could do that through a vaccine, they could turn that vaccine into a two-part uh, Novichok agent. And they could, they could. And I talk about that in book two and stuff like that. Oh, I shouldn't give away too many spoilers. But, you know, this is about governing the people. And I forgot to switch some of these pictures. And uh, we're still talking about this and going on. And uh, basically, this is Colusius. He goes over and he talks about how to try to create a better government, that he had an idea for a better government. And in the book series, we will be exploring these kind of ideas. And we'll be exploring it through uh, Colusius. I got a little bit off on my little rant here today about uh, some of the politics and some of the things going on. But, you know, most of it is funding the Urantium book series. So you can actually see this artwork become better, uh, move into maybe the trading card game if there's still an interest in it. I, I'm not even sure if I'm going to actually release the trading card game. I am so angry at the... Uh, gamer world that I may never actually release the trading card game because the uh, disservice that Board Game Geek actually committed, uh, the hate crimes they aimed, their cult of woke uh, launched their hate crimes at me. And uh, because of that, I may never actually release the Uranthium uh, trading card game uh, because I don't see any reason in it. Now, this is the best one. I like this as the best image for Colusius. I like that wrinkled forehead right there. That's perfect. And then the ears are a little bit better. Take off that third bottom piece right there so can round that off. And then we probably got the ears correct for the sea elves, as far as the sea elves are concerned. Because see, these edgings right here, these are actually kind of a signaling device because they do live underwater. And when they're underwater, you need another way to communicate. And that's part of the system that they have going on there. Uh, the scales are too big. That's, uh, that's a disappointment that we keep getting these dragon scales. But um, that's all right. Uh, we still got the mustache. We'll just have to give them a little shave there. Uh, take off the sides a little bit. Narrow that beard out. And then we'll have a perfect Colusius. And that's the best Colusius that we actually got with that. Well, thank you. Join me again for another rant and rave video of the Uranthium book series and the motivations behind it, because it actually mirrors a lot of the uh, activity that I've been working with here in politics for over, uh, 
oh, for over 50 years of trying to crawl out of this North Korea of the USA version of uh, constant perpetuated poverty and these hate crimes aimed at me for being much too creative for a bunch of imbeciles that are not creative enough around me to actually be what they are. And it, it, uh, it's frustrating and it's infuriating to, uh, to a level to be uh, not, not rewarded for your level of creativity when you should have been rewarded for it for a long time ago uh, because of a bunch of people who just wanted to be selfish and greedy. I mean, they started stealing my artwork back in the seventh grade for a yearbook. It was called Above, Above the Crowd. It was a husky on a flagpole above the crowd. And, well, Neil Bowers took that one. And um, anyways... Uh, he decided to take that one because I couldn't afford $5 for India Inc. And at the time, India Inc. was necessary for the printing process that they actually used for book covers. And, um, and, and you know, that that's uh, how bad the poverty actually was for me growing up as an artist here. And the reality is there's a bunch of wealthy fat cats that just want to pay their own kids, but they don't really want to pay real artists. So, And when their kids grow up, they... Uh, they want to take care of their own wealthy kids before anybody else that's actually probably more deserving. And uh, that's that's what creates the conditions in North Korea here in the United States of America, that those who can really do are actually suppressed. And those who are just can only copy or steal, their ideas are being uh, aided by, these, uh, by the corruption that's going on here in the United States that's aimed at the arts. And, um, yeah, there it is. And, uh, well, anyways, I'm Mark Bromley. If you want to help me out, I got plenty of ways that you guys can do that. I have books you can buy. I have the T-shirts you can buy. I recommend going through Google Play because they seem to actually have actually uh, paid my uh, proceeds out without bickering about it. I discourage Amazon because it seems like they want to think about it. If I sell a book, they want to think about it, and uh, they don't have any right to think about it. I think if somebody bought my book after about a month or so, they should just simply pay me my proceeds instead of trying to think about it. And um, yeah, and that, that's just the things about the bad politics going on here is that they they're not re, they're not paying the people like they're supposed to. And they're not funding people. They're just ripping people off for their bad policies and their terrible, uh, their terrible rhetoric in politics. And you can see it. Two fake news articles written about me here in the state of Colorado because the Democrats were upset that I might win their the elections uh, against their puppet candidates who are just a bunch of NASCARs with sponsor tags on their suit jackets. And maybe we should actually make a law like that down at the state legislature that all elected officials must wear their sponsors' names on their jackets while in performance of their duties. That way we know who owns them. It would make more sense, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. It would. That we should see who owns their ass and instead of having to listen to their stupid legislation where they think they can these days legislate lies and then try to enforce a way that we have to obey lies. That's tyranny. That's the rise of tyranny. That's the rise of North Korea. They're taking their playbook from Xi Jinping and Mao Zedong and whatever other kind of little tyrant you can think of. And it, that's why I keep calling them Nazis because most people understand what the Nazi is. And if you can add that globalist to it, the Ghazi, now you know what the Ghazi is. The Ghazi is the progress, the progression of that kind of think within our modern philosophy, which just has proliferated a bunch of thieves and crooks within our modern corrupt political system that is no longer democracy. You know, back in 300 BC, Socrates and aristocracy had imagined democracy as the highlight of a republic. They knew about sociology, psychology, and political science, and those three fake sciences could only lead to socialism, communism, national socialism, and global socialism. And we started teaching that in the 20th century in our schools. 
There's a reason why the world did not embrace those ideas, because they knew they were oppressive, that they were just another form of terrible monarchy being imposed instead of democracy. Anyways, I'm Mark Brownlee of the Uranthian Book Series. Thanks for being with me. This is Calusius, and uh, you all have a very great and happy day. Thank you.